One in two people will be touched by cancer. My body was broken, but that broke my mind too. I wanted life to end. That's how bad it had got. And he stood by me as my rock. We as South Asians face health inequalities within a system that's not designed for us, but then we have to have this fight against our own community. Hi, welcome to Changing Suits. My name's Belle. And my name's Taj. On this week's episode, we want to discuss something that is touching so many lives. And I'm going to, before we get into talking to the guest, I actually want to pick up on the stats, because this is something I um, regurgitate so many times because it's so important. When we were younger, on TV, we'd always hear the stat, one in five people will be touched by cancer. Then it went down to one in four. And now we're in 2024. And the stat is one in two people will be touched by cancer. Now, that is absolutely crazy. I mean, I, I just think, how have we got to this to this um, stage? So we wanted to discuss cancer and what it's like going through the journey. And I'm going to let our guest um, tell us her journey. But also there was a word that she used just before we um, started recording, but I want her to say it because it's more impactful. So today we've got Sabah Sadiq uh, with us, who is the co-founder of Asian Star Radio. And if you live in West London, you will know which radio station I'm talking about because everybody listens to it. So how are you, Sabah, today? You okay? I am very well, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you very thank much. You. Yeah. Now, in regards to cancer, talk to us. What What is your journey um, with cancer? Because like I said, so many people are talking about it and it's one of those subjects we don't want to talk about, but we have to talk about it. So talk to us. Where, where did it come to you and what's going on? So with, with me, I came at cancer with very little knowledge uh, and that was a huge mistake um, because as you say, the statistics are so stark, one in two of us will be affected. So if it's not you, it's going to be someone that you actually love. So we need to be far more knowledgeable and aware of cancer symptoms, diagnosis, all of that. So back in 2021, I started to feel very unwell and I was going back and forth with my doctor for about six months where he was just telling me, oh, Mrs. Sadiq, you're a woman of a certain age, it's menopausal symptoms, oh, it's IBS. And I wasn't being taken seriously, but I didn't have enough knowledge myself to think that it could be anything else. Coupled with the fact that we South Asians, the doctor is, he's king, you know, whatever a doctor tells us, we listen to because they're the experts. So I believed them and why carried it merit. Why did you keep going back? Because you go once, you go twice, and you're like, the doctor said, no, get on with it, basically. So what made you keep going back? So my symptoms were very subtle and they were just very general and they were persistent. They were ongoing. But as time went on, they were progressively getting worse. And it was in, at kind of like that six month mark. I actually had a um, routine appointment with my dermatologist who looked at me and said, oh, Sabah, have you had your stomach checked out? That doesn't look right to me. Um, and I said, oh, yeah, the GP has said it's nothing, nothing to worry about. But she goes, no make an appointment, make sure you're seen. Because the other thing was at this point, I hadn't been seen, physically seen. I had oh. had e-consults or telephone calls. Can uh, I ask uh, you, Sabah, on in regards to your symptoms, what, what were your symptoms? Because because I do want, if listeners go through these symptoms, this is not a scare thing, but it is an awareness raising um, exercise as well. What were you going yeah. through? What were your symptoms? So I started off with night sweats. I started off feeling very tired lots of lethargy just not feeling generally right um and yeah, that at, at is first all yeah that is all menopause symptoms. exactly mm -hmm. yeah so at first it was but they progressively started getting worse my I put on a weight I put on lots of weight but it was all centered around my belly around my tummy um, I then started to needing to go to the toilet a lot more, weeing a lot more, and I would eat a little bit and I would start to get really, really full. Now, post my diagnosis, I know these are all the symptoms of the cancer that I had. So fast forward, I went and insisted my GP did some blood tests and find out what's going on. They did. And at that point, they found that my cancer markers were raised. Now, I've had six months of the real worst of the NHS, but then within the next eight, 10 days, I got the absolute best. Because within say, 10 that that's the interesting bit. I mean, I was talking to my friend about this and she said it's you have to be that bad for the NHS to be that good. And that is such a shame. But we are lucky yeah. to have the NHS. It's unfortunate we're in that situation as well. 
absolutely it? and i commend the nhs i you know the people that work within it are absolutely brilliant and they are doing the very best they can with the resources that they have but the, the system is underfunded it is as simple as that so within 10 days i had had an ultrasound a ct scan more blood test an mri scan and on the on the 10th day um because this was following the cancer pathway i was told mrs sadiq you will suspect ovarian cancer and my world fell apart because, yeah, I, I'd had friends who'd walked the cancer journey. There was, um, you know, some people in the family, but it was never really talked about. And the very first thing they ask you, you know, during that initial consultation of diagnosis, so they can plan the pathway ahead, is do you have a history of cancer in the family? I immediately said no. And that wasn't because I knew for sure. That was because we never talked about it. That is so interesting. Yeah. And, and it, it's only subsequent to my diagnosis, my treatment. And like two years later that I've now found out some very close family relatives, female relatives were also diagnosed with ovarian oh, cancer. God, so no one was talking to each other and telling each other because it's the no. age thing. Keep it to yourself. Keep Don't it to yourself. Time. Because the, the first thing that I found was like, and especially talking to relatives that are back home was, oh, well, how long have you got? Yeah, there is this immediate assumption of it's a death sentence. Cancer is a word that, well, you're going to die. They don't understand but you, that. But, but do then you I think suppose you can't blame people because that is the way it's seen, isn't it? Cancer, that's it. That's the end of it. But then it but goes back to what you said earlier, Sabah. Yeah. So we're like, oh, we're in this because this conversation is it is very raw. I mean, it's something we've been touched by as well. But it's a fact that look, we don't educate ourselves. Yes, we know that one in two people, those adverts are having the impact that they are they need to have. But campaigns like I can't remember the surname, but Deborah, who had the bowel cancer, I saw yeah, something bowel that came. Yeah, I mean, she was fantastic and the awareness that she raised. But the issue is until we unfortunately have to go through it ourselves, we're not educating ourselves. Therefore, even that quietness within the family of don't tell anyone, that is just having a massive impact on everybody in the community. Why do you Absolutely. Think, why do you think we're still at the stage of not telling each other and talking to each other? Times have moved on, but why haven't we moved on in it, our thought process? It's, it's crazy, isn't it? Because we're in 2024. You'd think, you know, we're fourth generation South Asians here in the UK, that those conversations would have grown and developed. I think in my instance, the, the, the thing that why there was such a lack of conversation around what my diagnosis was, because it was a gynae cancer. I was diagnosed with stage 3C ovarian cancer. You know, within the South Asian community, we don't talk about females we don't talk about female okay. body parts yeah. and if you're talking about anything that's below the waist you can forget it that conversation never happens and even if it does happen the immediate reaction within the south asia asian community is it's always in a sexual context and not a medical context mm -hmm. and i think that's where we need to start opening up and having these conversations so that we are normalizing them as you know, medical body, ter medical terms, medical body parts. So it is a very factual conversation. The other problem is, is that the, the barrier of language within like the Urdu, the Hindi and the Punjabi language, for a lot of these um, uh, diseases, there are, is just not the language. I mean, even in Punjabi, there's no word for breast. There's I'm a word just going to say that um, I went with a family member and they had to have the conversation translated and the translator used I know it's just a really awkward word for breast and I was like I've never heard of breast being called that because there, there is, is no word for it yeah I mean I mean you you know Apart normal, from breast, normal, but yeah you, there's chati but chati is a chest yeah. and not a, yeah. yeah and it's not breast and the same goes for me when I got my diagnosis trying to explain to my 84 year old mum what ovarian cancer was literally I had to get photographs off of google to show her look this is the womb and even like when you talk about it, there's no word for ovary and even the word for womb is bachedani what does that yeah, mean course. something you put a baby yeah. in you know fallopian tubes forget that uterus forget there is just not the language around it um so that was one of the, the i think one of the difficulties that i found that it was because it was a gynae cancer it was even less talked about because of the whole associate sexual association mm. how um, did you tell the community or how did how, how did you first come like you found out did you tell your immediate family how did it go how so for, for me um the minute I got the diagnosis, we left that 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 hospital room and we sat in the car for about half an hour. Me, it was me and my husband, um, and I hadn't computed it myself. I hadn't digested it myself because 
all I, I, I at that point, I couldn't even hear when she was giving me the diagnosis. I couldn't even hear. All I heard was humming. But by the time we sat in the car about half an hour later, I just burst into tears because I, it's just it just fine. Everything finally hit me. And the first words that came out of my mouth were, was, how am I going to tell my children? My children aren't young. My children are adults. But as a mother, your immediate reaction is still your, your, your child. doesn't matter how old they are. The one decision that I took very early on, early on, and it was a very conscious decision, was that I'm not going to shy away and hide anything from my children, irrespective of what this diagnosis or whatever route this diagnosis will take. Because um, at that point, I didn't know about the real roller coaster of a difficult treatment journey that I was about to embark on. Um, I have a son and two daughters, and I was going to be honest and upfront with all three of them. I wasn't even going to shy away from difficult conversations with my son because at the end of the day, the statistics are scary and the and knowledge is power. And I didn't want them to 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 be to be bystanders within my 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 treatment. And this became really, really important, sort of like a year into my journey. I had my first surgery. My first surgery sadly failed. They opened me up and they found that the cancer had spread too far and they they didn't operate. Sabah, can I ask you something? Just I know you mentioned your stage three and from the conversations I've I've had with people, stage three is quite far, far down the journey. Yeah. yeah. What what firstly, how long does it take to get from? I don't know if there's a stage zero. I think there is to stage three. Firstly, and it varies. It completely varies. I mean, so within ovarian cancer, um, I have there is high grade, which grows very, very quickly. And then there is low grade. Mine was low grade. So it could have been growing for quite a while. But the thing is, is that there I I still go back to that six month period when my doc, where my GP didn't refer me for anything that maybe they could have caught it at stage two. Maybe I wouldn't have had, you know, there's lots of what ifs, what ifs. The tough thing with that is just from the GP's point of view, because we've done a lot of work on menopause and it's always a case of, you know, GPs never take menopause very seriously. But it sounds like your GP said it sounds like the um, symptoms of menopause, for example. From the GP's point of view, it's a tough one, though, isn't it? I mean, those it's not. symptoms, is it not? It's, OK, go for it. Talk it's to not. Me Why not? It's not. Um, at the end of the day, it's a business case. The, what I don't understand about the NHS is why they don't look at this as a business case. And that's across the board with any diagnosis, right? The earlier you catch it, the less evasive treatments for the patient, but also the less money it's going to cost you. Yeah. Now, they the the problem is, is that with ovarian cancer specifically, what a GP will only see one ovarian cancer patient in his lifetime. Because, oh, wow. yeah, but the, the cases of ovarian cancer are now increasing. 7,000 women a year are diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And actually 200 of those come from Slough. The Slough stats are really high. Um, Do we know the, why at all? Is there is there... a lot of research going into that, um, but it's it's literally it's parallel to cancer generally that the cases of cancer are increasing. I mean, you know, going from one in five to one in two in that short space of time. So. There is um, a lack of education on the part of GPs, and I think that needs to be improved so that they are far more aware of the, the nuanced differences between menopause and ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. But the very simple thing is, is that there is a blood test that they can do, which is so inexpensive. It's a blood test followed by an ultrasound. And if they just did that as a first port of call, I wouldn't have had to have yeah. what I went through. Yeah, see, we lived in Norway for about five years. And as soon as you went for an appointment, they sent you for a blood test. It was like, oh, yeah. God, not another blood test. It was a blood test for anything. But they don't do that in this country. You have to almost fight for a blood test in certain, certain yeah. circumstances. Mm -hmm. So it's really strange that, yeah, it's just the system. It is. And especially, and you would think that, you know, like now when you go to the GP, it's a case of, oh, you've got 10 minutes and you can only tell me about one thing. Yeah, and they're all connected. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. And so you, your your resources are so stretched. So why not make use of the inex, inexpensive tools that you've got in your kit and, and you know, you know, make use of that so that you are being able to diagnose a lot quicker and, and a lot sooner for, for people like me. Um, That's a really good point. I didn't think that. Yeah, that, would have, that blood test would have saved you all of those other things if it had been caught, uh, maybe if it had been caught at an earlier yeah. stage. Yeah. 
Sabir, this is where you realize we go back to certain parts and we'll go back to when you go through your operation. But I've got a question for you. One thing you said a bit earlier was the fact that you wanted to have these conversations. You wanted to, to be very open um, about this. Can I ask why? Because my children are older and I didn't want them to be in the dark. The statistics are so scary and I wanted them involved in the conversation I'd seen other people go through it and I had seen um, the turmoil that a cancer diagnosis can bring, not only from a, a physical health perspective, but also from a mental health perspective. That decision of mine was validated sort of like 12 months later when I had been, had my first surgery failed, I had IV chemo fail. Um, I had side effects that, you know, any side effects chemo could chuck at me, it did. The IV chemo failed, so I my options were getting fewer and fewer. I then went on to oral chemo, and if I thought IV chemo was, you know, bad, I, I did not know what I was about to let myself in for with the oral chemo. At that point, it what left me... What is oral chemo? What is that? Is tablet. it tablet? Tablet. Tablet. Daily okay. tablet. Every day. Keep it in the fridge. Got to be stored at a certain temperature. And you take one tablet a day. Um, and what were the, the side effects for that? For you? Because it's so, different for everyone. It is. It is absolutely different for everybody. So with the or with the IV chemo, I got everything. So from sickness, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, um, aches, pains. I developed peripheral neuropathy in my hands and my feet. And literally, um, I was at a stage where I couldn't even walk by myself unaided. I couldn't go to the bathroom. I couldn't wash. I couldn't shower. There were times when I'd go to the bathroom and there would be an accident before I actually reached the bathroom. But this is an extreme case, isn't it? Because I've heard of people that have been on chemo and their hair hasn't even dropped out. And yeah. they have just carried on. So it's individual. It's how absolutely. Each individual handles but then it comes. It comes back to what you said earlier. If it's caught early, you don't have to get to the stage where you are going through IV yeah. chemo and you know oral oral chemo. Oral chemo. I'm assuming is more systemic, I mean, which is well, why I, the side I think we side effects. Be careful there, because oh, at stage, it might be that you still need to go through the chemo and stuff like that, even if it is caught at an earlier stage. Um, yeah. So we need yeah. to be really careful in regards to oral chemo, because you've said that. That was worth net worse. Now, looking at how the, the science behind IV and oral, it makes sense that oral chemo is worse because it gets more systemic, which means the side effects are uh, worse. Yeah. But what happened there? But, what was... OK, I'll take you back a little bit because I need to explain why I had to go on to the oral chemo. Yeah. So the IV, IV chemo failed only because my biopsies had subsequently come back and they had found out that I had low grade cirrhosis ovarian cancer, which doesn't respond very well to IV chemo in the first place. Oh, but okay. if my results had come back sooner, oh, I wouldn't have even had to have had it. Now, the other problem is, is that the oral chemo that I had at that point was only permitted um, as a second line defense to um, treatment. First line had to be IV chemo. You had to sh prove that IV chemo had failed in order to be be able to put onto the oral chemo. But you it's just said money. That, but it's you just down said to money. It didn't, like the cancer that you did have, it, the IV wouldn't have helped anyway. Is that right? But, uh, yeah, but, that, but, they but they didn't. But they, but they didn't discover that until I had already started IV chemo. So that, that, because IV chemo is their first line defense, they have to give you IV chemo. If that doesn't fail, then they'll work to second line and second line is oral. Subsequent to that, the medication that I was on has now been last licensed as a first line defense to to um, ovarian cancer. So that's how I came to oral chemo because of the, the grading that I was on for my um, cancer. Um, Oral chemo, as I said, it it broke me. It literally broke me. And on top of all of the other um, symptoms that I was already experiencing from IV chemo. So, you know, I had, as I said, the sickness, the nausea, the fatigue was actually just so awful. But the, the one major new side effect that this gave me was a rash. Now, the rash, it kind of like started on my face and it looked like acne, acne, teenage acne developed, went onto my chest, but then it spread to my whole body. At this point, 
I was searching desperately online on and one of the things that I did very early on was make sure I didn't go into any dodgy websites. Yeah. If I wanted information, it was Macmillan, it was the NHS and it was the nice website. Anything else, you went down a rabbit hole and you would yeah. spiral. So I stuck to that. Yeah. Mm. And it got very scary at some points. So and I looked for, well, what is this rash going to look like on me on South Asian skin? Didn't find anything. Nothing on the NHS, nothing on the NICE, nothing. I even went as far as the pharmaceutical company that manufactures, produces the medication. They have nothing on what that rash is going to look like on South Asian skin. If you want to know what it looks like on Caucasian skin, yeah, they've got picture after picture after picture. But this and comes down to um, also, we do quite a lot of work on research as well. The South Asian community don't come forward to be part of research either so that doesn't help it's more the caucasian community that does hence why there's all that information out there okay for me that is not entirely true i okay. think that yes there is a very um there is a large hesitancy on the part of south asians and it well the bame community generally right, yeah. um but i think that has a lot to do with trust issues from a yeah. system that marginalizes them already yeah. but from the other perspective in defense of my community we're not asked mm -hmm. 9 times out of 10 we are not asked That's true and i am um, on on this point i i i mean I, quite recently we've had this exact conversation with um with with again an organization we're working with and this is it that mistrust is big but one thing that yeah. came out of projects that we've done is the fact that they don't know about it exactly and, what, and this is where I'm going to go on a bit of a rant so you're going to have to uh, bear with me for a second so I've heard that in Asian um, populations the, the communities insurance is higher council tax tends to be higher in these um, situations and where you things that words that are used are um, was it hard to reach? And that drives me. Oh, out. that annoys me. That there, and you know what? It annoys me. That does the same does. Thing. Oh, the I am. I am with you on that one. Do you know what? There is no such thing as a hard to reach community. You just aren't trying hard enough. I agree. Okay, so, with you and 100%. this is so. Here, here it is, ladies. Listen to my thoughts. So, if we're not using the services as much as um, other um, communities are, should we be paying less taxes? That's a political question. I'll leave that rhetorical, though. You don't need to answer that. <laughs> so let's talk about your um, your your own journey, Saba. So you've got to the oral um, IV uh, chemo treatment. How long were you on that treatment for? OK, so um, I was on the medication itself for seven weeks. Um, and during that seven weeks, as I said, it broke me because this rash wasn't just a rash. Um, it started, as I say, on my face, spread to my chest and then was all over my body. What happened was that my skin started to peel and it peeled from head to toe. So I had raw patches of skin all over, even down to the soles of my feet. So I couldn't even walk on it on them where the skin was feet peeling and flaking off. The skin dried. So they were like dry, jagged edges that I would be walking on on the soles of my feet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was no information around how to treat this, how to take care of it. I was just given a bag of pile of creams to use. And that was that I was in the space of those seven weeks. I was hospitalized four times because of it, because what ended up happening was that the skin itself was trying to repair itself so quickly. It was taking all the heat from my internal organs. So what would happen is that I would get up in the morning and I'd maybe have a bite to eat. Then I would start shaking and I would start shivering because my body couldn't control its temperature. I wouldn't be shivering for like five minutes, 10 minutes. I'd be shivering for like five, six hours till, oh I, literally, yeah. till I literally passed out. So when I was hospitalized, the A&E doctors diagnosed the reaction to the, the, the medication as what an acid burn victim would suffer. So that's oh, wow. what my that's what my skin looked like all over my body. I stuck that because my options had been growing less and less and less. And this was kind of like last last place saloon, you know, if the 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 oral chemo didn't work, they didn't have many other options left for me. And so I was determined to to stay on it for as long as possible. When I went back to my oncologist, she said, actually, do you know what? I'm so proud of you. She goes, most people don't last more than two weeks on this. She goes, but you've stuck it out for seven. Um, and the symptoms thereafter continued for another three weeks or four weeks. So, but it had done enough. It had done enough to shrink the tumours for the surgeon to look at the scans and go, yep, yeah, I'll give you another go. 
I'll give it I'll give it another go. Um, so, yes, as, as much as it broke me, um, it did what it needed to. Can I ask, my, what do you, Seba, what do you mean? Give it another go. What does that mean? Sorry. Surgery. Because my first because my first surgery had failed, they had closed back up and they hadn't removed anything. All they had done was remove the um, ascites and the water that was uh, they drained that from my tummy, but they hadn't removed any of the cancer because it What's had spread ascite? too far. Sorry to be... it, it's it's liquid with the, the, the cancerous cells just floating okay. around in the water in the lining of your stomach. Okay. Um, when I say that oral chemo broke me, it broke me because physically you can imagine what it must be like that whole cycle of waking up, shivering, shaking, six hours, seven hours, and then passing out, and then waking up to do it all over again. That went on for a good four weeks. So my body was broken, but that broke my mind too. I had been this tough, I'm gonna fight this, I'm, gonna, I'm determined, I've got kids, I wanna see them married, I wanna see my grandchildren. I had that go attitude, but this broke me. Those three or four weeks took me to some seriously dark places with my mental health mm. because it was like I was in this dark place that I just didn't see a way out of. Were you offered any mental health support? Um, I was after, um, but, but I was just not in a physically well enough place to be able to do anything. And um, what I said earlier on and this was the point that I was going to make about involving my husband and my children and being as open with them in this conversation as possible that became so important at this pen at this point because I was shot physically I was shot mentally I didn't have the physical or mental capacity to advocate for myself they had to become my cheerleaders they had to become my advocates they had to speak for me and because they had been involved in every appointment every letter that I got every single step of my journey they knew what 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 I was going through they knew what they needed to say to the doctors they knew what what kind of help I would want because I couldn't ask for it myself but the mental health I wanted life to end that's how bad it had got and I am not I'm not the kind of person that has ever had those thoughts before. So that was just so alien to me that to, to work through that. But, but I am, I'm, I'm an extremely spiritual person. I am very strong in my faith. And what held me at that time was Allah's mercy because he carried me through that. He held my hand through that every step of the way. His mercy and the love of my family around me, that's what got me out of that dark hole. What also helped is kind of like the med had started to wear off. So I was beginning to physically start to feel a bit better, which gave me the ability to be far more lucid and far more, you know, give myself a kick up the backside, except that, you know, that been, it had been a dark point. Um, and, and except that I'd overcome that challenge, sorry. Nice. It it's still a little bit that that bit still becomes a bit raw when I talk about it. But I don't think without the strength of my faith, um, that 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 period was. If I look back at it now, I don't know how I got through it. So, how long ago was that? That was in March of uh, sorry, that was in November of twenty twenty two. So it's not even that long ago, yeah. Sometimes it feels like it was a lifetime ago. And I've, I also post that reached this stage where I had very, I had a very tough time processing it. And I did go for the counseling because I desperately needed to be able to process it and unpack it. And there was a period where I couldn't even look at it as that happening to me. I would talk about it and I would think back about it in the third person that that didn't happen to me, that happened to somebody else. It was like that period was I was watching a movie and that was the life of somebody else that I was watching. And that was the only way that I was able to stabilise myself through it. Have you had that conversation with, with your family? Because look, I've been in situations where there are family members that have gone through a lot. And as someone looking on, it's it's very tough. It's not the same as what that person's going through, but it's a very tough situation. Have you spoken to your family about what they went through that, in that period when you were so low? Because that, that is tough. Yeah. It's it's extremely tough. 
And there would be days that I would lie. I would lie to them. They'd say, mom, how are you doing? Or my husband would say, how are you feeling? And I'd say, yeah, I'm okay. I'm actually, I'm better today. I'm be and I would put on this facade because during those moments, like when I was, you know, when I would be shaking and shivering and I'd be pass just, you know, passed out from exhaustion, I would look at their face. I would look at their faces and I would see the desperation in their eyes, the pain in their eyes because they were helpless. As much as they wanted to hold me, help me do something for me, they, they were helpless. They couldn't. It was just it, it was what it was. And, you know, you know what South Asian men are like. We don't talk about our emotions. Um, but that is a period of time that not only I think it brought us closest together as a family, it brought me and my husband closer together because, you know, you're, you are at the lowest you will ever be in your life. And for someone, some, you know, and he stood by me as my rock and I have, I, I cannot thank him enough for that because I and I and I think to myself, you know, how, would I have been able to cope watching him if it was the other way around? And I don't know if I could have. And he just he stayed so strong for me because oh, I Sada, was. Oh, don't do this. <laughs> sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. We I'm, don't, I'm, we I'm don't realize we no, don't realize the person that's ill and going through it. They're going through their pain. They they haven't yeah. got the energy to think extra beyond what they're in. Yeah. Um, and the but people watching them it's very hard for the but people you say you say that what's what's interesting and we've had this conversation before um outside of this um episode where it's a case of you decided to say oh i'm doing better but obviously that's not what what was going on in your head that that is the truth essentially and i don't know you know hopefully your husband listens to this and then has a go at you because I would. I'd be like, why the hell didn't you want to tell us? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I'll be honest. Subsequently, I have, and I think what what needed to happen was that that was a really dark moment, and I had to process it myself first. And once I had gone through the counselling, that gave me the tools to be able to talk about it with them. And I, mm. I don't think I was equipped enough at that moment to to do yeah. it. Um, and the other thing that I really learned about kind of like my loved ones, my family, my friends, um, was that they all have their different love language on how they would treat me. And it was funny because like my daughters, their, their love language was that they took over, they stepped up, they took over the cooking, the cleaning, the running of the house, all of that. It was just done, you know, and that was their way of just supporting me and, and letting me know that I can just, I can, I can just spend the time trying to get better. My son, on the other hand, being another South Asian male, you know, he just <laughs> had no no way of ex expressing how what his concerns for me were. And his love language was chocolate. I'm a chocoholic, right? So what he would do is every single day when he'd come home from work, he'd bring me a little mini bar of chocolate. Oh, and we would good. just yeah, that's and good. we would just we, he would just sit on my bed and we would just sit, we'd have a chat, and we'd eat chocolate. And I knew that was his way of telling me. I'm here for you. It's okay. We're going to be all right. Um, so it was, you know, they all have their different ways of, of expressing how they feel. But the other interesting thing was, um, if I come back to the outside and wider community, it was like there were friendships that I thought would last a lifetime that disappeared. Oh, God, that's uh, really Yeah. And, and you, you know, you, and there were people that, you know, I had just a hello, hi. We were just, you know, we weren't like besties or anything. And they just stepped up. They stepped up and, and they were there holding my hand through every single step of that journey. And, and I, you know, they were amazing, absolutely amazing. But on that point, those friends that you thought would be there for a lifetime, but what happened? What do you think from their point of view happened? And it I, could I, be the truth or yeah. not, but from your perspective, what do you think? I'd like to think it was the fact that like me at the start of my journey the lack of education that they just didn't know what to do mm -hmm. I, that's what I'd like to think um I don't want to think of the other possibilities that it could be because there are lots because I've have I have encountered those too that you know oh I might catch it oh we don't want that bad luck near us yeah I've heard so many varying different stories you about be educated enough now yeah at this point to yeah you sorry, would okay you would. sorry can I just ask is that an assumption you're making or did 
did you actually hear that? Because I'm shocked that that's yeah, I've I've not experienced that myself, but um, okay. along the along the journey, I I I do a lot of um, work around raising awareness, and I talk to other cancer uh, thrivers and cancer survivors, and you know the stories that they tell about the you know the the difficulties, the taboos, and the stigmas that they've experienced along their journeys, and and some of the some of the things are just just laughable. It it is you would think you know like you say we're in twenty twenty four those things shouldn't you know should not be happening there are still people there are still people with the mindset that oh you know you don't want to don't associate with that person you don't want to invite cancer into your life or oh um don't tell, don't tell anyone because your daughters won't get married you know those mindsets are still prevalent within our community which is really sad do you think that's continuing in other generations because i get it from the first generation i got it because it would have come back from from the east and and that was that was just the mindset which is fine do you think that's actually carrying on with other generations then um yeah i think subtly it is there is hereditary trauma that still continues i think it's getting a lot better i think the fact that people like me are out there they are sharing their stories and those stories are so powerful because um within we we share a part of ourselves when we tell our cancer journey and our cancer story but it also um for me, for me, it's a two way street. I mean, I've been doing, you know, sharing my story now for about a year and a half. The number of women that have connected with me via LinkedIn, via Instagram, via Facebook, and they have said, thank you. Um, I didn't know that. I'm now going to go and get a cervical smear. Thank you. I didn't know that. You've you've given me the permission to talk about what happened to me, what happened in my family. And, and that's the whole purpose. It's about encouraging these conversations these are very uncomfortable conversations but they are very necessary conversations given the, the stark statistics that we have and it is only when we start to have these open and frank conversations and normalize them that that change is actually going to come we as south asians as i said is a double-edged sword because we face the 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 um health inequalities within a system that's not designed for us and we've got to face those challenges but then we have to have this fight against our own community yeah. we need to be you know we need to be addressing both um in order for me it's it's become uh, you can call it a mission you can call it whatever you want but for me i i want to I want to challenge both. It's not that I, I'm defending my community and I'm not saying anything to them and I'm just shouting about the health inequalities. No, I'm pulling my own community up and asking them to to turn the, 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 mirror, the mirror to themselves and look at the unconscious biases that they also have. The lack of trust. Well, why do you have that lack of trust? Engage more, find out more, educate yourself. At the end of the day, my aim is, is that if I can get one person to think about their health, think about those symptoms, know about those symptoms, go and find out more about those symptoms, it will stop one less me being created. The me that didn't have the knowledge to know what to look out for. Because if I had, I would have been far more persistent with my doctor. Education is key. Knowledge is power on so many different levels. Education means that we are going to have women that are informed about their physical health, their mental health, their gynae health. When you have somebody that is informed, they're able to self-advocate. When they're able to self-advocate effectively, they are going to be able to push a system that's not designed for them to give them the best treatment. So for me, symptoms, awareness, education, it's vital. Do you think in that case, and this is something I was, I was going to bring up prior to, to you mentioning your friends, but you did mention your family by, by that point. At the start of your journey, you said, look, it, it was horrible telling people because you'd, you know, they'd be like, oh, you know, can't this is the end, essentially. And that's where community has has had a negative impact on on yourself. However, as you were going through that journey, your family and those friends that did stick with you, again, that's the community that essentially saved you plus your faith of course yeah so you know we've had a few episodes where this happened where you know there is a negative but there's also a massive positive when it it feels Absolutely. like the nhs it feels like the nhs actually it has to get that bad for it to get that good <laughs> that's yeah. essentially what it is <laughs> yeah i look at it in the terms that you know um before cancer life was very different cancer came along and it woke me up to so much of what was wrong in my life 
apart from kind of like my community, me, me as an individual, the things that I held on to as priorities, things that I put, gave precedence to, things that I put first, it made me reevaluate and readdress all of those. So now work doesn't take priority. Yes, you've got bills to pay, but work doesn't take a priority. Home time, family time, being together, all of those priorities, self-care, self-love, giving time for me as an individual, not a mum, not a wife, not a friend, not a sister, but me as Saba. Self-care became really important. And also the value of me and my time for people that didn't value me and my time. So, so it's... It, it, it really, it gave me the ability to work out what was normal, but it also gave me my voice. And that's not to say that, you know, I work in broadcasting. It's not to say I didn't have a voice before, but it was having a voice in the right way that makes impact, that it, that is able to, you know, ask for change. It's able to support other people in the change that they may want. Um, so cancer has been eye-opening it's been life-changing but it's also been life-affirming and that's one of the reasons why I don't call myself a cancer survivor I didn't survive anything I I got through by mumbling and bumbling and you know just going on this roller coaster ride that I didn't know what was coming on in the next day and I just got through it but post-cancer I am now thriving and I am thriving and living the life that I should have been living a very long time ago Usually we ask, to, oh, what are your main points that you want to round up on? But you've ended it at such a beautiful way. We just want to thank you for your time. It's been such an eye opener and such an important message that you've brought to us. I mean, one thing that's come across in this podcast ever is, you know, you are a kick ass woman. I have to oh, bless you. I've got loads of people around me all of a sudden just to let the listeners know. Yeah. I've had to change where I am. But thank you so much for sharing your journey. It's it's amazing meeting you through this um, episode as well. And now I've learned that you're from Slough. We'll be catching up after this podcast we will. as well. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. And I think, you know, the only last thing that I will say to anybody watching this, whether it's you or whether it's a loved one, make sure that you are symptoms aware. Educate yourself. Go and find out. Make sure as a woman you are getting those tests, you're getting those cervical smears when you should, and you're getting that mammogram. When those letters come, do not ignore them. Do not ignore them. They're for your benefit. Um, and make sure you are going for, for all of those exams. And there is a load of information that you can access out there. There are some brilliant websites that you can look at, the Macmillan website, the NHS website. It's got a wealth of information. Don't go down that rabbit hole of Google, just stick to those you know trusted sites um and there is always help and support available out there um and and yeah be your own be your own best advocate you've got to know and be able to advocate for yourself um so educate yourself perfect thanks so much for your time today Sabah. it's been absolutely fantastic talking to you and you're welcome learning about your journey thank, thank you. you thanks for that, having me thank you very much that's goodbye from me and that's goodbye from me Follow us on Instagram and Facebook, changing underscore suits, and subscribe so you never miss an episode.